Welcome back, everyone. I hope you had a short dinner break, but now we have a wonderful panel, really the all-star of China experts in the United States, and I'll just introduce them briefly, and then Joe Nye will lead the discussion. Liz Economy is the Director for Asia Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations, soon to be also of the Hoover Institution at Stanford, where we will welcome her out in California. She's actually doing this for us tonight, even though she's moving tomorrow. So she gets the MVP award. And of course, Liz has written a lot on Chinese domestic and foreign policy, including her recent book, The Third Revolution on Xi Jinping and the New Chinese State. Min Xin Pei is one of the foremost China scholars in the United States. He's a professor of government at Claremont McKenna College, and he also focuses on economic reform and governance within China. Mike Pillsbury is the Senior Fellow for Chinese Strategy at the Hudson Institute and has been a high-ranking government official in the Reagan administration and elsewhere and is a regular commentator on China and beyond. And Joe Nye, of course, who's our moderator tonight, but who is a China scholar in his own right. Let me just set the scene for us. Ambassador Tsui Tenkai was with us yesterday and he, amongst other things, denied that millions of Uyghurs are being held in re-education camps. Um, he said very little about postponing the Hong Kong elections, but he emphasized again and again that a new Cold War with the U.S. is in no one's interest and cooperation is. Uh, we had the foreign minister of Singapore this morning, uh, Dr. Balakrishnan, who was very thoughtful. Singapore continues to walk this tightrope between China and the U.S. He took no position on the South China Sea because, of course, Singapore isn't a claimant. Um, Prime Minister Morrison of Australia was far more forward-leaning. They're doing a lot to build up their defense forces. They've clearly opted into the Quad uh, Alliance. Uh, they're very worried about what's happening in China, even though, of course, there's lots of trade between Australia and China. And so you're seeing a lot of different perspectives. And so we're now very excited to turn it over to you and hear a U.S. perspective on U.S.-China relations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anya. Uh, I must say that we have had a lot of China. Uh, and today we started with uh, Foreign Minister Balakrishnan, but I was also asked by uh, uh, about China in, in the by Gideon Rockman in the interview I had this morning and he asked me about is this a new cold war and I said the trouble with these historical metaphors is they can mislead us because it's really a it's a rivalry but it's a different kind of rivalry whereas we had very little trade or social contact with the Soviets uh, we have a lot of both with China and therefore it's a very different type of arrangement in addition to that, you have some issues like climate change and pandemics where we can't do anything unless we do cooperate with China. So we have something that's quite new, a what I call a cooperative rivalry in which you have to pay attention to both sides of that at the same time. And that's not easy. Uh, rather than pontificate about it from Washington's perspective, we have fortunately three people who are really expert on what's happening in China. And in that sense, uh, with the 30 minutes of presentation that we have, uh, we don't want to waste it on historical metaphors about the Peloponnesian War or the Cold War. I'm going to ask questions about what's going on in China and what can we do about it? To what extent can we shape Chinese behavior? And to what extent uh, are we, uh, do we understand enough to be able to make the right strategy to shape it? So having these three experts, all Mandarin speaking, who know a lot about China, gives us a, a great advantage to make progress in this direction. Let me start with Mingxin, um, who has written a very interesting uh, uh, article recently in Foreign Affairs, and who has taken a rather uh, a pessimistic view from the Chinese point of view of, of their future, uh, which echoes something that was said by an economist at our Aspen Strategy Group last week, who said that in 20 years, uh, we would be seeing a China in decline. That's certainly very, very different from the sort of assertive wolf warrior China we're seeing today. Mingxin, what, what, what do you see happening inside China and how's that gonna affect our ability to shape Chinese behavior? Okay, uh, thank you very much for having me. 
I think for the short term, probably there's a little bit of a boost for Xi Jinping's authority. He uh, overcame the initial difficulties of dealing with the pandemics. And even though uh, there was huge misstep uh, on the part of the government and he was shaking in his leadership at the beginning, uh, the quick response and the uh, effectiveness of the full mobilization model appear to have uh, helped him. Secondly, uh, the escalation in US-China relations has also boosted his uh, temporary authority because there is a rallying around the uh, flag effect. Uh, but this, uh, the, uh, he's spending his political capital not in terms of designing a long-term strategy dealing with this radically different environment. He's spending his political capital on uh, the next party Congress, on securing his third term, uh, moving his people into place and getting rid of the biggest headache, political headache domestically that is actually Hong Kong. Now with the uh, passage of the national security law, he appears to have uh, at least temporarily dealt with that issue. Uh, within the regime, I do see that there is full realization that China is now in an open-ended conflict with the US. Uh, and uh, uh, rhetorically, they do have a problem how to tell the Chinese people about this because this is a very somber message. And also at the very senior level, they have another difficulty of how to communicate uh, their strategy, their uh, intentions, uh, their goals to the outside world. Uh, so we see quite a bit of mixed messaging going on within China. But in terms of strategy, my reading is that a long-term strategy, uh, a very mixed one, uh, seems to be emerging. The fixed part is that the party will maintain a very solid, iron, brutal control on um, domestic uh, uh, within China. That is, repression will remain as intense, if not more intense, in the coming years, uh, both to defend Xi's uh, authority uh, through internal purges or suppress societal challenge to the Communist Party's rule. On the economy, there's a lot of debate about the future direction of China's development strategy. Uh, Xi Jinping floated the idea of relying mostly on domestic growth, but there are a lot of different voices challenging this assessment. So this is a strategy, a pillar of the new strategy that is still being debated. And the third pillar is what will China's new geopolitical strategy, strategy look like? This is the one that is unsettled. And it seems that China has the most difficulty formulating a new strategy in response to American shifting its policy. And my uh, uh, analysis is that it's politically very difficult because a shift would imply repudiation of Xi Jinping's policies for the last few years. And that's something he cannot uh, accept. And secondarily, an adjustment will entail a lot of domestic policy adjustments, especially uh, on the issue of human rights, domestic repression, economic reform. And that's something that will, again, be unacceptable to Xi Jinping. And third is that uh, a lot of the hardline stance like wolf warrior, uh, the hiccup with India, and uh, uh, Hong Kong actually reflect Xi Jinping's own philosophy and ideas. Uh, so that's difficult to change as well. And Xi himself uh, had, uh, is actually uh, a pretty weak leader when it comes to leadership judgment capabilities. He's fairly mediocre uh, in terms of experience. And he has a very, so he has an inflated sense of Chinese power uh, uh, he just as a person, he's, uh, he suffers both from overconfidence, ex excessive risk taking, and also deep sense of insecurity and inadequacy. Uh, so, uh, and on top of that, China currently has a very flawed uh, policy making system uh, based on over centralization and uh, 
uh, the uh, dominance of yes men, quite mediocre people in the system. And uh, also, uh, and Xi Jinping himself is just not uh, really adequately briefed, understood. I just want to share, uh, I end with a little anecdote uh, told me by a really well-placed Chinese uh, 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 academic who used to advise the government. This person used to advise Jiang Zemin, Hu Jintao. Uh, last seven years, he's never met with Xi Jinping. So I uh, asked him what, uh, uh, whether Xi Jinping actually is in touch with the reality. He said he doubts. Uh, secondarily, uh, he revealed to me that two years ago, Xi Jinping himself was shocked that the US-China relationship took such a bad turn. She, uh, and he saw that uh, China was, he was very poorly served. Uh, so this, uh, uh, this means that uh, probably given how bad things are, the US can do a lot to shape Chinese behavior to at least to communicate to the Chinese leadership through various channels, the severity of the problems they face and also the potential. That is, uh, there are a lot of things China can do to uh, improve its ties both with the US and slow down the pace of confrontation. I think I'll just end up here and here uh, for, the, for now. Thank you very much, ming -Xin. Let me turn to you, Liz. And um, I've learned an enormous amount in reading your book, which I uh, also endorse Anya's suggestion everybody should read. But um, uh, we know that the party in the past has derived legitimacy from a high rate of economic growth. We know that the growth rate is now slowing down even before COVID. And uh, does it then wind up turning to nationalism uh, as its alternative source of legitimacy? Uh, does that explain sort of this wolf warrior approach where they've blown the opportunity after the initial COVID uh, problems? And uh, what's, what does this slowing growth rate mean for Xi Jinping's foreign policy initiatives such as the BRI or the now quieted 2025 plan and so forth? And what could we do about it? <laughs> okay, in the next five minutes. Okay, thanks, Joe. It's great to be here uh, with you and also with Minchin and, and Mike um, uh, to have this chance to talk about China. Never a, a dull moment, um, that's for sure. You know, I guess I, I would say that overall, um, the pandemic and the slowing Chinese economy have had less of an impact uh, on China's pursuit of its foreign policy ambitions than, than I would have imagined. Um, you know, even in the midst of the pandemic, uh, China, Beijing was, you know, pushing ahead with its sovereignty claims in the South China Sea. You know, it sunk a Vietnamese fishing boat. It named 80 new features, 55 of which were underwater. Um, it had the deadly border conflict uh, with India that Minsin mentioned. Um, it sailed its uh, ships into Japanese territorial waters uh, for more than 100 days uh, straight. Uh, of course, it legislated uh, and uh, brought into um, uh, force the new national security law uh, in Hong Kong. Um, the BRI uh, lending actually continued, uh, even at the height of the pandemic in the first few months of 2020, BRI lending uh, went on. Now, BRI investment uh, fell off fairly significantly. Uh, and I think we are gonna see a shift in the nature of the Belt and Road uh, uh, initiative moving forward away from uh, so much hard infrastructure, emphasis on hard infrastructure like ports and railroads and, and highways and more toward the digital uh, belt and road, satellite systems, e-commerce, uh, fiber optic cables, and the health silk road, uh, which has really come into its own as a result of the pandemic. And we've seen China really pushing this notion of the health silk road. So, you know, constructing hospitals, sending out teams of doctors, uh, enabling countries uh, to sort of uh, following the path of, of China's contact tracing, surveillance technology, um, actually advancing traditional Chinese medicine. Um, and that, that has the, the, the health and digital Silk Roads have the advantage as well of not being as reliant on, on the state, on state-owned enterprises, but also engaging a lot of, of Chinese um, private enterprises. Um, and of course, you know, Beijing announced an impending new strategic partnership with Iran. Uh, so I think there's a lot that, that has happened over the past you know, six, seven uh, months uh, that, that really surprised me uh, because one would have anticipated perhaps that Beijing would take a step back and focus uh, much more uh, on what was going on at home. 
Um, I think the one area on the global stage where China is really likely to take a step back is on its climate change commitments. Um, I think the Minister of Ecology and Environment announced that uh, the uh, targets was going to have to take a step, China would have to take a step back from its more ambitious environmental targets. And we've seen that CO2 emissions have jumped back up to pre-pandemic levels already. Uh, so they were supposed to deliver uh, a new action plan uh, this year. That's, already been postponed, I think, at least until the end of the year. Um, some people are suggesting they'll wait until uh, the new U.S. administration to see whether uh, there's going to be, you know, renewed interest in the U.S. getting back on board. Um, and, you know, in terms of, of the wolf warrior diplomacy and the turn to nationalism, I think absolutely. Uh, and with the slowing economy, you know, Xi Jinping was forced to uh, you know, forego his, um, you know, doubling income, meeting the doubling income target. Uh, it looks like they're not going to meet the poverty alleviation target uh, that he had set out. So those are two big hits. So where do you turn uh, when you are, you know, forced to move away from what was going to be this, you know, very significant announcement of success on Xi Jinping's part with, in terms of, uh, you know, economic and uh, the economy. Uh, and I think you turn to nationalism. And uh, certainly the U.S. Uh, enabled that in part, um, you know, the Trump administration with its constant, you know, hitting on uh, the China virus and the Wuhan virus, et cetera. I think, um, as Minchin suggested, you know, served to sort of rally people around, um, uh, around uh, Xi Jinping and around China at a time when, again, in those first few months, there was an enormous amount of criticism of the regime, right? And it was the first time, frankly, that I had seen that kind of civil society activism and energy and engagement uh, via the internet with people, you know, communicating, you know, trying to get sort of trusted, verified information about what was going on. You had all those citizen journalists flooding into Wuhan. It was really exciting to see I think in January and the early parts of February, what was going on. Um, but then there was the crackdown. And again, you had the US pressure coming in and, and this sort of sense of, okay, well, you know, we're not going to criticize ourselves when we've got the United States criticizing us too. So um, wolf warrior diplomacy, very unattractive. Uh, I think it undermined uh, what should have been um, a win for China in the end. Uh, you know, China did manage to get the virus under control. It was able to provide the PPE for uh, much of the rest of the world, uh, and yet they ruined it. Uh, I mean, they shot themselves in the foot uh, by going out there and demanding thanks from other countries or threatening Australia, uh, you know, and putting, uh, banning beef and putting tariffs on barley because Australia called for an investigation into the origins of the virus. So um, I think, you know, it was an instance where, um, you know, really uh, Xi Jinping, uh, you know, uh, snatched, what is it, snatched defeat from the jaws of victory. Uh, so um, I'll, I'll stop there. Um, I guess maybe I would just conclude by saying in terms of where all of this leaves China and its global standing, I would say to my mind, it's really the pandemic has just reinforced how countries already viewed China, right? So what was their, their predisposition beforehand? So if they were largely supportive of China, uh, say in Italy or Hungary, uh, they tended to laud China's success and welcome its PPE. If they were countries were more skeptical and concerned about the lack of transparency, uh, human rights repressions, uh, for example, the United States or maybe even the UK, uh, I think then you got a very different response. They tended to focus on uh, the downside of how China managed things. Thanks, Liz. Let me turn now to Mike and uh, say, Mike, you've been a long-term and eloquent uh, writer and observer about China's strategy. Uh, and I'd be interested to know, um, from your perspective, uh, do you see a bright future or not? Is this economist I quoted um, from last week uh, too pessimistic about China going into decline in two decades? Um, can China's behavior be constrained and changed? And if so, how? So Mike, what do you think? Well, my view of Chinese strategy, Joe, has been in, in all three books uh, that they debate strategy. There's no single monolithic uh, Chinese view. And it's very much in our interest uh, in these debates that certain, uh, certain points of view win and other points of view lose. Uh, part of my own experience in the government in large part has been with net assessment over about a 40 year period. 
And you always want to look, one thing Andy Marshall taught us always is look at your own strengths and weaknesses and then the other side's strengths, in the case of China, especially weaknesses. And uh, uh, Min Xin has written two books on, on the topic, highlighting weaknesses, problems. The other side is the World Bank, the IMF forecast, the Goldman Sachs forecast, that whatever the source of these Chinese growth rates, uh, we don't seem to understand what are the levers we would have to apply to change the Chinese growth rate, that is to slow it down. For example, if intellectual property theft is a major portion of their growth rate, choking that off, which the phase one trade deal has enforcement mechanisms about that, um, should slow the growth rate. And the, the so-called Thucydides trap of fear will never happen. But when you ask economists, and we paid a lot of money to a lot of economists to tell us what exactly are the sources of Chinese growth, what you find out, they say all, they all pretty much say the same thing. Well, it must be capital, wherever they're getting their capital. Uh, well, could that be choked off? The answer is yes. Demographics. Uh, and here, I was checking your own uh, book, Joe, on page 198, 199. You go into our, our demographics are one of the few countries in the world on the growth side, and China's decreasing the size of its uh, workforce. Thirdly, productivity. And that's where the economists all get into fights with each other. Productivity is kind of a buzzword, which I think means I don't know. Somehow technology, science, uh, certain procedures, operations research, in the case of the Japanese, somehow this magic factor works. And in the Chinese case, they have had enormous productivity growth. Again, can we somehow affect that? Or as Liz kind of hints in her foreign affairs piece last year on neo-Maoism in China, are the Chinese their own worst enemies? Are they gonna make mistakes? Back to your question about can we induce change? One of the things that's come out of the first phase trade negotiations process, we learned two things. Number one, tariffs work. Remember, there was great doubt about that, an enormous opposition. But we learned from the Chinese themselves that they had their own list of reforms they wanted to implement. And our pressure, and this is a concept the Japanese used to tell us about too, outside pressure that strengthened the hand of the reformers. The guys who wrote in the party Congress, uh, the market is the decisive factor, which really isn't the case in China. But they, that led them to sign up to 95 pages of detailed promises with an enforcement mechanism. So that's clearly change took place in China with reformers helping us. Some of these delegations were 30 people from various, it's like an interagency nightmare where they're all watching each other but progress came out of it. Now, I'm more concerned, as you know, about the military side of things. And our own uh, uh, plans, as publicly announced, are to really build up Guam, to have a very good 360 degree defense on Guam, maybe $20 billion over the next few years. It's called the Pacific Deterrence Initiative, for lack of a better word. That is one of the things we're doing. Will that affect Chinese military decision-making. Well, super hawks in China say, oh my God, uh, Americans want to come at us in the first island chain with Guam as their base, which some Americans have unfortunately publicly stated. Americans who have four stars on their shoulders, Joe. The other thing we're doing is talking about missile defense being more comprehensive, not just Iran and North Korea. The Chinese instantly pick up on that and State Department's disavowal that a missile defense against China is not our goal, that looks hollow to certain Chinese in the debate I mentioned to you. That they fear the American nuclear strategy seeking what they call absolute superiority over China. They have thought they had a second strike capability, but it's beginning to look like there's a debate about that as well. So they did, they did not show up June 24th in Vienna, despite the president's own personal invitation to participate with the Russians and, and the Americans on e either a cap or at least could they accept the concept of strategic stability, confidence building measures, all the things that you live through that had to do with start and assault. The Chinese say, no, that's not for us. And their explanation is fascinating. 
we're too weak. We're not at the point yet where we're at the same nuclear delivery level as the Russians and Americans. So sort of a comeback and then the American side says, and the Russians are helping us, well, gee, when did you plan you know, for us to come back? And they won't say. How many nuclear warheads have you got? They won't say. Why do you think you have a second strike capability? They won't say. This is after 15 years of track 1.5 and track two talks. So these military uh, areas are sometimes looked down on by sc great scholars like uh, Liz and Min Xin. But to me, the doing or undoing of a, of a Cold War and a Thucydides trap has a lot to do with these military issues and how the Chinese perceive what the Americans are up to. My own view is bipartisanship is our only hope. The Chinese are exquisitely sensitive to political conflict in Washington, DC. They know everything about Steve Bannon and Peter Navarro and, you know, is Larry Kudlow more of a hawk than Steve Mnuchin? They fill their papers with this kind of detail. Most of our China experts can't name all the members of the Standing Committee of China. They have no idea of politics at the very top. So there's, a, there's a, a, an asymmetry in analysis of being able to understand how are we affecting their debate. We have a lot of American experts who say there's no debate in China. They're a sort of a Nazi party and it doesn't matter uh, what, what these debates are all about. I don't agree with that, but how to influence them seems to me involves understanding how we're perceived in China and how that debate focuses on what we do. So bipartisanship helps us enormously. It's our multiplier, if you will, because when they see, oh my God, all the Americans from James Stavridis over to Mattis, over to you name a super hawk, all agree on this. For example, build up Guam or China. You come to the talks on nuclear arms control or else you'll be punished. That really has an impact and I think will induce change in China. But the more polarized we are, the more we attack each other, uh, the less hope there is of our influence in China. Great, well, thank you very much, Mike. Um, we have now reached the point where people, uh, participants get to uh, use the last 15 minutes to raise uh, questions. And I have a number of people on the list already. Let me first uh, turn to Nassim Kader. And uh, Nassim Khadr, if you can unmute yourself and uh, make sure your video is on, uh, you, you will have the floor. And it's going to take about 10 or 15 seconds for it to, to uh, all register properly. But Nassim, give it a try. Otherwise, let Min Xin say some more. <laughs> so, Nassim, are you, if, if you're not there, then I'm going to yeah. turn uh, to uh, Jeannie Nguyen. Um, Jeannie Nguyen, can you unmute? Uh, and yeah, I'm here. Okay, it, it, uh, speak up. My question is to Dr. Min Xin Pei. What do you think Xi Jinping and the PRC look at Vietnam and its role in their overall strategy of the China's uh, trim? Would Xi Jinping allow Vietnam to be more democratized, more independent and lean forward with the Americans and the international, the, the free world? And yeah. how, what, what techniques, what has been most successful for the PRC in their coalition to what the Vietnamese leaders? Well, uh, I think China's long-term strategy for Vietnam is that it remains a one-party state, uh, independent from big powers. It will, uh, what I call strategic neutrality is what and then political autocracy will serve China's interests the most as far as Vietnam is concerned. I think the biggest question is really for Vietnamese leaders. Do they want to fundamentally improve the quality of their relationship with the US by taking the next step? 
Vietnam has already moved faster than China in terms of political change, and it can actually do a lot more uh, and uh, uh, make some even more fundamental changes that will solidify, that will lay an ideological or value-based foundation to its long-term strategic relationship with the US. And China really cannot do that much uh, in terms of influencing that aspect of Vietnam's decision-making. Thank you. Next on my list is David Shambaugh, and he's going to be followed by Mike McFall and Chris Stone. So David, uh, unmute and uh, let's hear from you. Uh, hi, uh, greetings. Thanks, Joe and, and colleagues. Good to see you all. Greetings from Northern Michigan. So um, Mike's, uh, Mike Pillsbury spoke about China's weaknesses and both uh, Min Xin and Liz have talked about the messaging uh, issue. Min Xin talked about China's internal messaging, Liz, uh, the wolf warrior issue. So I'd like to ask all of you, including Joe, because you've written about soft power somewhat, you were the father of soft power, Joe. How um, do all of you see China's uh, messaging um, in the US-China competition framework? You know, they're multi the competition between the US and China is gonna play out in multiple domains, including the perceptual information domain. And that's an area where I think China has a lot of weaknesses, as, as Mike referenced. They live in what I think is an echo chamber, and they're not very adroit at, at adjusting their messaging. So I'm just kind of curious. I'll throw a softball question to all of you, including Joe. Um, how do you see this playing out? How the US could take advantage of China's inept messaging and weak soft power, uh, and vice versa? Thanks. Let me ask Liz, then Mike, then Ming Xin, and then I'll put a footnote on if there's time. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, David. Uh, so I, I think um, China's, we know China's soft power is weak. You know, soft power is organic and emanates from a culture and the ideas and what makes a country attractive to others. And I think the Chinese leadership finds it very difficult to not um, make it more of a government oriented effort. Uh, so it has to have control. I think this is especially true with, uh, with Xi Jinping. Um, you know, frankly, uh, it's astonishing to me, given how um, challenged the United States has been over the past three years with its own uh, soft power, with the Trump administration and with our relations with our allies, uh, just how little China has been able to accomplish uh, when you look over the past three years uh, in terms of winning over uh, some of the United States' uh, partners and allies. Uh, so to, to my mind, uh, you know, in some respects, Xi Jinping and, and his desire for control and just the ugliness and the repressive nature of the regime was really the greatest gift uh, to the Trump administration and really salvaged us for the past uh, three and a half years in our own standing on the global stage. Mike? Uh, there's a book called The Beautiful Imperialist by a guy, it couldn't be you, David Chambao. He has the same name, David Chambao, but it couldn't be you because you you look much too young to be <laughs> the author of that book. But it's the first real study of debates in China. And it argues that the professors were more ideological than the frontline uh, warriors, if you will, at the New China News Agency and the think tanks were sort of in between. This hurts China's soft power uh, capabilities because of their system, there, you could find out by living in Beijing for a year and keeping track, and you could write the book to assess the, the issues in the debate. But Chinese themselves, when they're on soft power missions, they can't do that. So the fact of their kind of intra-party democracy going on, and the fact that they have different views, and they're not all wolf warriors, there's some globalists, and I, 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 words fail me for other debate voices. So they're handicapped by their own lack of democracy. And if, if Liz is right about the neo-Maoists have arrived and are not leaving, then China's handicapping itself except for money. This is where they have it. I mean, there's stories all over Africa of a Chinese coming in with a briefcase, a large briefcase. It's a million dollars in cash to do X, Y, Z. So I don't know if Joe, as the father of soft power, included cash bribes, but the Chinese have had a lot of success in that. Frankly, if they came to me and said, here's $10 million, could you say Xi Jinping is the greatest you know, leader in the world? I'm sure I would say no and turn down the money, 
but I'm not sure all other China experts would be so ethical as I would. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Uh, Mason. Just a quick word. I think the U.S. can do a lot more by uh, living by its own values and examples. I think what uh, could have happened much more in favor of the U.S. in the last few years is uh, U.S. would not, uh, U.S. simply will just live uh, up to the expectations of what people around the world think the U.S. should, should be doing. I, I think that uh, did not happen. Uh, just think how different the world would look like had the U.S. Uh, pursued uh, a policy that truly uh, reflects American values. And my, my footnote, David, is that um, I think Chinese soft power is greatly overrated. If you look at this London index, the soft power 30 that's published every year, China comes out about 27 or 28 of the 30 countries. And they have two inherent limitations. One is it's very hard to be attractive in Delhi if you're killing Indian soldiers on the border in the Himalayas. And the other is that if you insist on tight party control, you undercut civil society, which is a great source of a country's soft power. If you have a genius like Ai Weiwei and then you expel him, uh, you undercut your own soft power. So I, I think Chinese soft power is actually quite limited. Uh, next on the list is Mike McFall. Hey everybody, uh, great conversation. Thanks for letting me in, Joe. Um, I'd like to uh, get a little bit more perspective on what Minchin said about she's erratic risk-taking behavior. Um, let's just say for, for the purposes of argument, we all agree with that. Uh, although the Trump administration's latest speeches don't seem to agree with you, Minchin. They have a much more strategic uh, assignment to Mr. Xi Jinping. But uh, in the spirit of the debates, could you all tell us what we know about debates about that erratic behavior? Uh, within the party, within the government, within the business community? Do people agree with it? Are they despondent? You know, give us some flavor in the spirit of Mike Pillsbury's um, uh, assessment that we need to pay more attention to these debates. Tell us what the debates are to the best of your abilities about Mr. Xi Jinping's erratic behavior. Yeah, I, uh, uh, you know, uh, first I have to admit that these days it is really hard to do China watching. China is more opaque than any time in post mao history. So we are now with the, not just economic decoupling, but what I'm afraid the scholarly cultural decoupling, it will become even harder in the future. But let me just uh, point to two uh, examples. Uh, that is the two very controversial uh, examples. So what's extra three? Uh, they are all signature Xi Jinping moves. One is the announcement of the air defense identification zone in East China Sea. The other is the, uh, uh, the building of artificial islands in the South China Sea. And the third is Belt and Road. That is, there is, so the, the ideas did not originate with Xi Jinping. The ideas were out there long time, uh, long, long before she, uh, a considerably long time before she came to power. But it was really on the Xi's rules that very, in very quick succession, uh, 2013, November, uh, then April 2014, and then I think it's uh, also 2013, uh, they were rolled out very, very quickly without adequate deliberation about the pros and cons. So that's just uh, a data point I can uh, uh, supply. And the other is that uh, the Chinese awareness of this fundamental shift in US policy occurred about two to three years ago. And you did not see real change on the part of Xi Jinping. And that's a big puzzle is how, why didn't that happen? Uh, let me try if we are quick to get Chris Stone in in the two minutes that we have left. Chris, are you there? I'm just kind of the grim, grim reaper when she shows up. It's <laughs> I am. 
Um, like the person with the long hook. <laughs> hey, uh, it looks like we've run through our time. Chris, we'll have to apologize. Oh. And, no worries. Thank you. Anyway, let me take the uh, uh, chance to thank our panelists. Uh, we had little time, but I think we covered an enormous amount of territory. And I hope we threw a little extra light on what's been a full day of China here. Uh, thank you all very much for joining the Aspen Strategy Security Forum, rather. And uh, I'll now turn it back to Anya.